So it's Lewis Matheson here. So you probably know me as a physics teacher making lots of online videos. But in this video, it's gonna be something a little bit different. And it's about what you can do in terms of facing the uncertainty that's now experienced in many countries. So what I have is a guest. So um, do you wanna just come in? So I'm Lieutenant Matheson. And before I became a teacher, I actually worked and served in Afghanistan as an army officer. I was a paratrooper um, and I actually worked in theatre as a joint terminal attack controller, sometimes called a JTAC or sometimes called a forward air controller. So I have experience of living and working on the front line uh, and I did this for six months in 2008. So I thought I'd share with you some of my experiences about what it's like to be effectively in a disaster zone where the normal kind of bits of society don't function. Now. Um, I suppose I've got loads of good war stories, you know, like lots of soldiers did, but I worked on the front line. So my job was working with an infantry company, so I was attached to them for the whole tour, and I would go around and I was responsible for all of the air assets. I was the only person who was trained and qualified and had the equipment to talk to fast jets, to talk to attack helicopters, uh, for the drones like Predators and Reapers, as well as coordinating things like airdrops in the middle of the night when we got resupplied support helicopters, you know, kind of uh, bringing in supplies and taking away prisoners and injured people. So it's quite a full on job. I was only 26 when I did it and um, I was quite lucky in many ways, but I'll talk a bit more about that later. Now, at the time, I think there are three main things that kind of uh, helped me kind of stay sane in that environment because it's amazing what you can actually adapt to. Now, the first one are the people that you surround yourself with and that sense of community. If, for example, um, the schools are shut and everybody's in their houses, what can you do to make sure that you keep these social connections alive? So it's gonna be talking to your family. It's gonna be looking out for your relatives who might be a bit elderly. It may be perhaps thinking about your neighbors and what you can do for them as well. And what about your friends? Those who are kind of maybe a little bit shy at school, maybe a bit unsure, because you know these are going to be unsettling and uncertain times. And if you can make sure that you keep these social connections alive, that's going to really help you get through this. When I was in Afghanistan, you know, we worked really closely as a team. I mean, we had to. We were literally living on the same vehicle where there's no way you could get away from each other. And actually what kept us sane is just the fact that we spent a lot of time talking to each other. And yes, there was kind of, um, you know, times when it did get a bit stressful. But I think we knew that the people around us would do anything for us and we do anything for them because we were working as part of a team. So when COVID-19 properly strikes, make sure that you look after people around you. And again, they're going to be doing the same for you. Are there some of your friends who are really anxious perhaps? Maybe just a text would really help them, maybe a FaceTime call. Those kind of things which you can do, even if you're not actually physically meeting them, means that you know you're in it with other people. Now, the other thing that you can do is think about planning for the worst, okay? so. What I mean by this is think about planning so that you make sure you're on top of your personal hygiene. For example, um, before I went to Afghanistan, I spent about three weeks in the Gobi Desert in Outer Mongolia, and I had horrendous diarrhea. And you know, this is the kind of place where Imodium, you couldn't buy it, and therefore Imodium was almost worth more than money. And I remember definitely lots of times uh, being in a tent where there's this kind of this wave of panic when you woke up in the morning, trying to undo the zip on your sleeping bag, then trying to undo the zip on the tent and then the other zip. I mean, that's three zips to get through and then rushing off into the desert to have some horrendous explosive diarrhea. And, you know, a lot of that was due, you know, looking back on it in terms of the hygiene, not just of ourselves, but the people who are actually uh, helping out with the cooking. In Afghanistan, it was again a place where there was a high risk of infections being passed on because everybody was living in really austere conditions, living right next to each other and on top of each other. But in six and a half months in Afghanistan, I didn't get ill once. I never had any diarrhea despite the conditions we were living in. And this was down to the fact that everybody took their personal hygiene really seriously. So most of the time, um, we were based in a forward operating base. And when we had food, everybody would be washing their hands really thoroughly before they ate. And there was alcoholic hand gel there. And we'd be using plastic disposable cutlery and plates. And because we followed these kind of um, basic bits of hygiene, that meant very few people actually went down. Obviously, some people did get diarrhoea. And I suppose there's often the kind of walk of shame where in the morning you might see a soldier 
dragging a, a sodden sleeping bag over to try and get it washed out by hand and they'd then be put into isolation on a camp bed and in 40 50 degree heat it's not the place you want to be i mean when i was out there we didn't even have a port -a i mean i remember when i first got to a port -a it was like a bit of luxury so basically we would uh, we'd have like a cut down oil barrel there's like a wooden seat um there's obviously loads of flies everywhere. You'd go into that, uh, you'd do whatever you did into that oil barrel. And then one of the poor soldiers who was kind of given the job for the day would be given a load of diesel fuel and a, a bit of scaffolding pole. They'd pour the diesel on, they'd light it and they'd just stir this kind of steaming thing of poo. So um, that's how we kind of uh, went to the toilet. And if we can survive, or if we did survive in those conditions, you know, compare that to what you're going to have, which would be a, probably a toilet in your house, you're in a much better position to keep the hygiene and keep on top of it. But basically you are responsible for your own hygiene and that will then stop any infection passing to the people around you. The other thing we did in terms of planning was we did lots and lots of training beforehand and actually we planned for things to go wrong. So this included uh, everybody there being responsible for carrying their own medical kit because we planned to get injured. I think actually... Um, Sometimes you don't want to know this stuff in advance, but when we were out there, I think there were some surveys done. And if you are if you were in uh, that part of Afghanistan, uh, I think it was like a 1 in 20 to 1 in 25 chance of being killed if you were in a frontline infantry unit. Um, but actually, there's obviously a higher chance of getting injured. I think it was down to like, um, I think something like um, maybe a 1 in 10 chance of getting seriously injured. So what we did was we carried medical supplies with us all the time. Personally, I always carried in my pocket of my trousers uh, some morphine, a tourniquet and a bandage, which I had on me every time, everywhere I went anywhere. I also had in my webbing uh, loads of first aid kits. So um, on my own self, again, I had another thing of morphine in my body armour. I had another bandage and two more tourniquets. Um, and that was just on me. On the vehicle, we had a vehicle first aid kit and we also had a company medic who had all the kind of proper stuff. Now, the thing is, you can plan for stuff and you can plan for things going wrong. And then most of the time, you won't need it. To be honest, when I was out there, um, my vehicle got blown up by an IED and I got injured. Uh, I don't really remember it because of the size of the explosion. But when I was in a vehicle, uh, we went over an anti-tank mine. I was right on top of where that blast wave happened. Um, and because of that uh, and the kind of, sort of injuries I got, I mean, luckily it wasn't too serious, but I got like mild traumatic brain injury. I got airlifted out on a stretcher and spent a few days in the hospital in Bastion. Uh, and again, I don't really remember much. It's a bit of a sort of a hazy time. But, you know, we were prepared that we had all the kit that we needed for me and the other people who got injured. The other thing that we had in terms of being prepared was the weaponry, which I know a lot of you are quite interested in. So a lot of the time I spent on a um, Mastiff armoured vehicle. We had a 50 caliber machine gun on top, we had a GPMG machine gun in the back, we had a Javelin anti tank missile, we had a couple of light anti structure munitions which are called LASMs, and that was just on the vehicle. And then we all had our own weapon, each uh, backed up with a pistol uh, and a bayonet and a fighting knife. All sounds really cool and obviously endless grenades, but the thing is we had that because of the threat, because of the contacts were happening within 10 meters. And the reason that I spent the whole time with the pistol because, you know, pistols are absolutely rubbish to fire. They're really inaccurate. But I had a pistol in case this jammed and we were in such close quarter combat that we needed it. And lots of my friends were down to using their pistols in some firefights. And lots of my friends were also, um, you know, drawing bayonets and fa attaching them to the weapons. I probably should have handed that back, shouldn't I? Anyway. Shh. So um, you can plan for every eventuality. And most of the time, you won't need to do that. Um, However, things did go wrong in time. I suppose they went wrong. It was kind of a war zone and therefore things did happen. In actual fact, if you watch at the end of the video, there's a bit of a statement about what I actually did in one particular encounter. But I was very much at the forefront of fighting and engaging with the Taliban. And even though that is probably the, one of the most highly stressful situations that you can be in, because I was with a strong support network of people I was working with, we had plans about what might happen in every eventuality, you could actually cope quite well in those situations. Now, something that uh, is going to be difficult is the sense of isolation if you're in your houses, if schools have shut, if people are working from home. And I found this in Afghanistan. And there were some actual benefits. Because we had to stay in the FOB, if we left the FOB, we would be killed. If the Taliban got us, we would have been killed. And that's kind of the way that wars happen. 
we knew that if we went, even as a whole group of us, if we went uh, about 500 metres away, we'd get into fi a firefight with the enemy because they were waiting there for us and obviously we were trying to attack them and so on. But basically, we spent a lot of time sat in the forward operating base. Probably about 95% of our time was sat waiting, getting bored. And I think probably in the six months that I was out there, I probably read more books than I have done in my entire life. So there are some real benefits about this kind of being alone or maybe being in your house, there'll be benefits that you didn't know might exist. For example, you might get a lot more reading done than you've done before. You might develop new social networks online, and I suspect a lot of you are going to know your neighbours a lot better than you have done previously, because you're going to be helping out in that sense of community. But I know at times it is incredibly boring. And at this time, I didn't have a mobile phone because we couldn't use them in case they were hacked by the enemy. Um, I think my iPod at the time had about 200 songs in it. And that was it. There was no internet and all I could do was read. But one thing that I, th I found really useful as a way of un unwinding was just keeping up with the exercise. So even though I was just doing laps and laps and laps of running, most days around the um, helicopter landing site, which was inside the FOB, and I'd be doing lap after lap after lap, that kind of kept me sane. It was a bit of exercise, a bit of relief, and it just meant that I wasn't thinking about where I was at the time. So if there are things that you can do to do some of your own exercise, make sure that you keep up with that. So it might be that you just do stuff like sit-ups and press-ups and try and doing, doing planks and stuff like that in your room. There's probably a lot of um, uh, circuit kind of stuff, even if you're not doing weightlifting, there's probably some circuits that you can do to kind of get your heart rate up and actually kind of keep um, keeping physically fit. It might be the case that you're in a position where you can get out and go for a walk or go for a run. Even if you're on your own, even just going for a gentle jog around your neighbourhood, depending on what's actually going to happen in the next few months, that could be your daily thing that just gets you out of the house and keeps you sane. So, I've been on the front line where people were trying to kill me, had a really high, it was a really, really high threat environment, and actually, it's okay when you're there. You will adapt to this and society will adapt and you will get through this at some point, especially if you're young, where actually the, the health risks to you personally are going to be quite minimal. So the three things I would say you need to do are first of all, make sure that you keep in contact with people like your friends, your family, and your neighbors to make sure that everybody's okay. If you're part of a sense of community, you're gonna get through this and you're gonna do absolutely fine. Make sure that you have a plan. Okay, you don't need weaponry and you don't need first aid kit, but it might be that your plan is, do you have an old laptop in the house that you maybe haven't used for a while? Can you get it updated? Can you get it working so you can access online lessons? Do you have a stack of textbooks that you've maybe borrowed from school? Do you have some empty exercise books that you can use to write in so when you're working through stuff and you're revising, you've got the stuff that you need? To be honest now, mostly what you just need is a pencil or a pen and some paper, and there's loads of free stuff online or good stuff that I've done as well that you can access, so you don't need to have a huge amount of stuff at home. And the third thing is how are you going to stay sane? How are you going to relax? How are you going to keep on top of your mental health? And exercise, you know, it's been proven that if you do lots of exercise, then that will really help your um, mental outlook on life. Anyway, um, enough war stories. Uh, I've got loads of good war stories, by the way, because I was right in the thick of it. Um, but I suppose, obviously, a few bad things as well. Anyway, um, what I'm trying to say is learn from me. You will do absolutely fine when you get to something which is probably a bit different to normal society, but you will cope and at some point things will go back to normal. Thank you very much. So the main thing is that you need to make sure that you stay safe and you look after yourself and those around you. Don't forget though that if schools do shut, I will be doing lots and lots of online lessons for both GCSE and A-level and you can find out more details on my website. Thank you.